Hello all, uh, welcome to the Enterprise Analytics in Cloud Sweat Bank journey as part of the Data and AI Summit 2022. I'm Vinit Menon, I'm heading the Data Lake Engineering for Sweat Bank and I have a co-presenter with me, Pratyush. Hi everyone, my name is Pratyush Raizada. I'm a customer success manager here at Immuta, responsible for some of our European customers, including Sweat Bank. So today in the agenda, uh, we will go through basically the Swedbank overview, a quick overview for people who aren't aware of what Swedbank is, our analytics platform journey, the migration strategy, which we have chosen uh, as our path, uh, the solution overall in terms of what Databricks and Immuta have helped us achieve, and also in terms of what's next uh, as the journey has just begun from our perspective. So just to give you an overview of Swedbank for people who aren't familiar with Swedbank, Swedbank is a Nordic plus Baltic based banking group. Uh, it has around 7 million private customers, 550,000 corporate customers. We are probably around 220 branches across both the Baltics and the Nordics uh, and roughly around uh, 17,000 employees. Now <laughs> coming to our analytics platform journey, which is what we want to present here. I The start of the Swedbank's analytics journey started way back in 2017 with the main intention of how the bank could make better use and get value of its data assets. At this time, traditional data warehouse and reporting was the way to go, but the term big data was getting hot. Uh, and in the Nordics, it was a pretty uh, prime time that time. And the business landscape was basically very interested in getting on board with this journey. Over the following 10 months, this data discovery platform or the on-prem data discovery that you see was born, basically a Hadoop-based system from the start, logically organized as an open platform where any team around the bank with needs for advanced analytics insights could move in. However, as data discovery platform was a system for insights and modeling, from the very start, there was always an envisaged a natural second phase of the journey, which was basically to operationalize and uh, industrialize at scale. So result of this was the Swedbank operational data lake, again, a Hadoop-based platform, now augmented with Kafka, with high availability and low latency sourcing patterns. It had the goal of continuously extracting the value from the data discovery teams, analytical efforts in the form of operationalized analytical data products. But with, I mean, of course, it served its purpose in terms of uh, how it worked and also uh, putting a footmark and for us in presence of the advanced analytics. But with any kind of on-prem uh, platforms, it also had its own uh, limitations, like mandatory investments in on-premise hardware. Uh, anytime we had the capacity issues in terms of upgrade and migration effort of existing services, uh, whenever there were new business requirements in terms of added capabilities, it was always a challenge. Uh, we had a multiple uh, kind of an uh, environment uh, ecosystem with a discovery platform, operational platform, and also an AI driven platform. So there was always the question of data replication across these platforms and also in terms of uh, support for third party solutions for uh, deep learning. So uh, with these challenges, uh, though it served the purpose, it was time to look forward. And this was exactly the time uh, when bank also opted off for the cloud first strategy. Uh, and the first instance of it, we really jumped onto this uh, journey or took the cloud leap, as we say, and built up the first enterprise scale analytics platform, uh, uh, which we call EAP in the cloud for Swedbank. So what is EAP? In simple terms, what we define EAP is a central, unified, scalable, cost-efficient, compliant, and a modern advanced analytics platform in the cloud, catering for all the business analytics and AI needs. Having a centralized ecosystem for analytics in the bank is a very critical part, which helps in avoiding silos and also replacing other similar and expensive tool set. So that was the basic uh, main purpose and the definition of what EAP was uh, from our perspective. And it was basically to cater to both analytics and the non-analytical workload requirements across the bank. And where we wanted it to be was not just about basically being a, a advanced analytics platform. We wanted this journey more in terms of a cultural shift also within the bank, because bank being a legacy organization with uh, close to 200 years of history, uh, this was a bit of a new journey across in the bank. So we wanted basically that 
we make an ease of access in terms of onboarding support and training for advanced analytics across the bank uh, so that the life becomes easier uh, and not complicated and not creating a fear in terms of that what this uh, all this can be uh, for other users in the bank then the next aspect was to reduce from a long time industrialization to short time to go to market uh, and that's a significant achievement uh, with this platform uh, so that there is better insights to and better value out of all the advanced analytics uh, that uh, we or from our business users have in the bank so in terms of again uh, driving based on value uh, which was a key aspect considering that uh, and uh, in any kind of enterprise organization, it's not possible for everyone to do everything and it's always a prioritized stuff. So deriving the maximum value uh, with a shorter time to work, it was one of the more cultural strategies which we wanted to build. And also in terms of building the capability and the sharing culture across. So it's not that it's a centralized kind of capability, but rather we decentralize so that we can scale analytics across the bank. So this is where we wanted to be from not just being a platform, but also in terms of how we can scale the analytics across the bank. Now coming to the migration strategy, and I, I was also thinking that this is kind of a key aspect uh, to show how our journey and how we placed and produced a focus-based journey around uh, what we wanted to achieve. And I think this can be a good insight for other uh, organizations who probably are taking this path in terms of the migration and the kind of have this fear uh, in terms of how the journey would look like. So one of the key focus areas was in terms of defining a very clear approach. Uh, we had a risk-based approach in terms of that uh, we always, uh, we were a bank and uh, it's always a challenge in terms of the compliance and legal requirements that, so we had a risk-based approach in terms of each stage of the journey to analyze, evaluate, feel, and make it and look at feasible feasibility perspective that how feasible are we in this journey towards the migration and is there a blocker or a challenge around it? We had a two-fold sourcing approach uh, because it wasn't the case that uh, just because we're migrating to cloud that we stopped the entire business, right? That's not a feasibility. So we wanted to have a two-fold sourcing approach that on-prem scenarios continued. There was still development, but then we also had uh, the whole data migration towards cloud. We also had, in terms of uh, minimal re-engineering work, this was kind of critical uh, because it wasn't the case that uh, whatever frameworks which were developed on cloud, wherever feasible, we wanted to reutilize them. Uh, of course, there were uh, certain other things where it was very clear that we had to take what was offered from our cloud solutions. But then in other cases where the frameworks were developed, we had to look at the options where we wanted to minimize the whole re-engineering part of it. And also in terms of that, like I mentioned, that wherever uh, possible, we did embrace on the cloud native services. Looking at the second aspect, which is the security part of it, and this is kind of uh, has, I don't have to reiterate, we are a bank, this is absolutely critical in terms of where we are. So in terms of all the key aspects of uh, security parts, right, in terms of authentication, perimeter security, encryption guidelines, considering that uh, we had all the challenges which came through towards EDPB, Shems through during our journey. So the encryption guidelines, what uh, was a kind of criteria and the requirement from our uh, group information security, the authorization part of it, and also in terms of the monitoring and logging, uh, which is also a key aspect in terms of the overall security part. Going to the next focus area was basically on the operating model. This was also extremely critical uh, to understand in terms of the roles and responsibilities because it wasn't a small uh, unit of four or five people who were basically making this change. This was a massive group. So understanding the roles and responsibilities, defining a very clear purpose-based onboarding uh, as a part of the operating model, defining how the teams should look like in terms of what's a central team, what should be done from an infra perspective, what should be done from a data uh, IO perspective, having a federated development as well as possible and also have a team autonomy so that the teams can make decisions under the umbrella of what's been defined in the architecture guidelines and also having a cloud foundation established, which is not just for us as in migration journey, but also for, for reusability when different other aspect, other uh, business units of the bank uh, decide to migrate towards cloud. And the last key aspect, uh, which is absolutely, again, critical was the risk and governance. So we embraced the whole risk and the risk-based approach, as I mentioned. Uh, we identified the risks uh, and did a complete, uh, I would say, a 
almost a six month risk assessment uh, exercise along with uh, the identified mitigations where possible and also identified the residual risks which would remain considering that there are certain challenges always in this case. We were a bank, so we had a huge journey in terms of covering around the different uh, units in the bank uh, and getting their sign-offs in terms of the group risk, the privacy, legal compliance. Uh, so the journey, how we approach it was to have those represented from day one, part of our uh, kind of steering group, which we had established so that they understood our journey. They understood what we are trying to achieve. And also from our side, we understood what were their requirements uh, to get this journey forward. So this was a key aspect and the focus areas which I've mentioned here, I think it's a good learning for us also in terms of the overall approach and also in terms of what's important, what's to be taken into the criteria of prioritization to have this journey successful. And that's how we've made this uh, whole journey of migration towards cloud successful in a bank like Swedbank. So what's achieved, uh, which is massive in terms of what's achieved. Uh, we have over 50 sources encapsulated 650 plus tables, which are migrated towards cloud, 600 plus ETL jobs, which are today operational in cloud, close to 100 terabytes of data, which is migrated towards the cloud storage. We have both uh, analytical and non-analytical uh, models, 18 and 24 uh, respectively, uh, which are today operational in cloud. Uh, and also to add on, apart from what's mentioned, we have also kind of decommissioned a complete on-prem ecosystem uh, as on today. So this is the massive, massive achievement in terms of where we started in our journey and where we are today. So value realization, right? This is a key aspect in terms of uh, what's uh, in it for Swedbank in terms of this whole journey. So what we've categorized is on four different areas of it, in terms of the business potential, in terms of the strategic direction, in terms of the positive implications, and also if we didn't take on this challenge, what would be the missed opportunity? So from business potential perspective, as I've spoken before, there's a reduced time to market in terms of provisioning access to real, that is the production data for different business units. Uh, so accessibility to production data all the time. And also in terms of all the available AI and ML programming languages at one click of a button through a centralized type like Databricks. So rather than having the challenges in terms of on-prem, in terms of installing third-party libraries, there were a whole plot of possibility of uh, and availability of AI and different ML programming languages at one click of a button. Now also aligning with the strategic direction of the bank in terms of that the key aspect of focusing on the fundamentals. So and that we've done by building a resilient and scalable infrastructure uh, and also ensuring that it meets all the compliance requirements to support and enable basically a complete widespread availability of advanced analytics across the bank. Also in terms of improving the operational efficiency uh, through streaming advanced analytics process. So from idea to productionization part of it, which is aligned with the overall strategic direction of go to market. Positive implications uh, with now the solution in place, we, yeah, we have the ability to detect and act on new patterns related to fraud and suspicious behavior. And also with sustainability as a key and an important criteria for the bank with the utilization of green cloud providers, we've been able to minimize on the environmental impact. Now compare, com coming to the fourth, that in case we wouldn't have taken on this journey, it would have been a missed opportunity in terms of being a digital laggard. We would have stayed back uh, on an on-prem solution, which later on wouldn't have been supported. There would have been an end of life, uh, and also in terms of where Hadoop has been heading, and also in terms of uh, lack of possibility to automate and digitize uh, in this era of uh, digital transformation. This is a key aspect uh, which is needed to help in the different business units of the bank to advance uh, and also enable their uh, analytics capabilities. So now coming to the solution in terms of how we've done and also in terms of how Databricks and Immuta have been extremely critical in terms of achieving this. So this is how our logical architecture looks like. Uh, what we have basically, I mean, uh, done through uh, Immuta and Databricks uh, and which has uh, made our lives easier is to ensure that the right people have the access to the right data at the right time. Uh, this is a key aspect, uh, which has been helpful in terms of having Immuta as an uh, access management tool uh, in our journey. What we also have, uh, which is uh, again, a bigger uh, significant advantage in terms of our on-prem solution is to have a completely separate storage solution in terms of Microsoft Azure and the ADLS part of it. 
this is key in terms of having a centralized uh, production data availability for all the environments for all our customers. This is a key aspect in our whole journey uh, to fasten the overall time to market. From the compute perspective, we've uh, had a very clear and selective choice in terms of uh, Databricks, uh, a completely segregated and separate compute platform uh, to support and really fasten the advanced analytics uh, capabilities and also in terms of uh, uh, complete uh, hub of uh, AI and ML capabilities that Databricks provides uh, to support our model development and the uh, analytics part in this journey. So this is mainly our architecture part of it and this is the logical uh, choice we've made in our journey in terms of how we want and what we want in our journey and who have been supporting us uh, to make this journey successful. So if you look at Databricks, uh, not something that uh, you people aren't familiar with. It's a unified data analytics platform. The key aspect is it's a cloud native security controls. Uh, so it's pretty much what would have been a direct choice for us as we move towards cloud. It is one of the leading platforms in terms of uh, supporting on the model training, feature development management, and feature and model serving part of it. It helps, uh, and that's been our need of choice when we selected Databricks in terms of improving the time to market, uh, and also in terms of uh, having the advanced uh, tools and frameworks which uh, we need uh, in our journey uh, to meet the advanced analytics needs of the bank. With Immuta also, uh, it's been a complete proper assessment done in terms of the different access provisioning mechanisms uh, which were there in the market. Uh, what were key aspects in our choice of Immuta was uh, ease of working with Databricks, uh, complete data governance package. So not just from the access management, but also in terms of the future uh, roadmaps which you want to look at in terms of the data catalog and anonymization, pseudonymization part of it, which Immuta has inbuilt capabilities of, uh, which was a key aspect in us uh, selecting uh, Immuta. Another aspect of it uh, in terms of uh, selecting Immuta was in terms of reducing the data duplication part of it by providing a unified access control uh, across all our environments, so be it the data discovery, the prod environments, uh, so which kind of, again, uh, helps in the faster time to market and also for our users uh, in terms of their uh, advanced analytics use cases. Now I hand it over to you, Pratyush. Maybe you can just give an overview in terms of the data access platform itself. Thanks, Vineet. For those who haven't come across us before, Immuta is how enterprises protect their data assets with scalable policies in the cloud. The challenge we see in the industry today is that organizations have a lot of data, but aren't actually able to use it to gain business and competitive advantage. This is because a lot of the data isn't easily accessible. Question often asked is, how do you enable easy access to the right data, to the right users at the right time, and do so in a secure, accurate, and safe manner? That's what we help solve for. The Immuta capabilities can be broken down into three components at a high level. The first is discover the data. So you need to have the ability to go out, scan, and classify the data. Find sensitive data specific to your organization, whether it's PII, PHI, or classified data, depending on your organization's need. You then want the ability to create and extend out the tagging capabilities, whether these are pre-built tags or custom tags based on your data elements. Organizations today typically integrate with one or more data catalogs, whether you've got like an enterprise data catalog or something that you use across the whole corporation. Uh, the idea being you pull all of that metadata that you already have, you pull it together and use that for policy enforcement. Ultimately, the idea is to make the life easier for data owners, stewards, and consumers in being able to search for the data and being able to put that data to use. The second component here is secure. And again, that has a few parts. The first being policy authoring. So as the volume and the number of data sources increases, so will the overhead in managing policies. In the role-based access control method, it's often, it often leads to a role bloat where organizations end up spending significant amount of resources just to manage uh, and maintain these policies. With Immuta, however, you can enforce what we call attribute-based access control, which is like passing variables to your code. The policy decision happens at runtime based on these attributes. Or you could look at purpose-based access control, which is access based on specific purpose. 
Um, for us, we believe that you should be able to write your policy once and execute it everywhere. So seamless policy, seamlessly enforce policies across all your different data platforms and reduce the overhead of going to separate data sources to create and manage roles and policies. The next piece here is orchestration. So Immuta provides the fine-grained access control where you're able to drill down into a column, into a row, or at cell level. The data is masked dynamically, something we need touched on earlier, rather than you creating copies of it. Policy orchestration and workflows um, that enable internal or external data sharing use cases are also quite popular um, that we support. Um, coming to data privacy, there are a range of privacy enhancing techniques that we offer, which can be based on your use case and needs. You could have simple anonymization techniques um, going from masking um, or regular road reduction to more complex policies like anonymization and differential privacy that tend to typically inject a bit of noise within your data, depending on your needs. The third key component is monitoring and auditing. You really wanna know what's actually happening within your data layer who the users are, what the policies are being enforced. You want a full history and audit of those, maybe from a compliance, maybe from a regulatory standpoint. Um, you want to see or have the ability to see what queries the users ran, the tables they accessed, the data user agreements that, stay, that exist today, the purpose the data is being accessed for, the policies applied and why. Um, ultimately, you want to do this in an easy manner where you're not wading through tons of paperwork um, and have the ability to run compliance reports on demand, uh, perhaps even do anomaly detection where some activity is happening out of the blue and um, out of a regular pattern. And possibly uh, as the next course of action, look at proactive measures where you're setting usage alerts and notifications to catch things like insider threats or attacks from external forces, et cetera. The next slide is just to give you a flavor of how policies are enforced within Immuta. So in Immuta, you can author policies in plain natural language. The idea is that policies should be easy to understand and explainable to everyone. At the bottom here, you'll see is an example of how policies look in, in Immuta. And effectively it covers four dimensions that you can use to construct a policy. The first being, what is the underlying data you're trying to protect? How do you want to protect it? Meaning what kind of uh, privacy enhancing technique? When do you want to protect this information? And lastly, who are the users who should have access to it? And these policies can be applied at a global level, which is say the entirety of your entire data lake or warehouse or wherever else have you, or at a local level where you're just focused on a specific data set. Everything here that we've just talked about, you can also do it through policy as code if that's what you prefer. Please feel free to hit me up at pratyush at immuta.com should you have any further questions about Immuta or you're looking to learn more. For now, I'll hand you back to Vineet. Okay, thank you, Pratyush. So, like I said, I mean, this journey has just begun, right? In terms of what we've achieved, this is, uh, we've had a clear target in terms of migration, in terms of decommissioning our on-prem platform and being on cloud. But what's next is the key aspect of this journey. So what we've done, so we have an extended access controls to cloud. So to decommission our legacy systems, the on-prem systems enable access to cloud data, which we've done. But the next step it is in terms of also supporting on the modernized data platform stack, right? I mean, not just looking at EAP as a lake, but looking at it more as a data app uh, in terms of hosting other uh, SaaS services probably uh, to enhance uh, on other different kind of workloads and support different more workloads, uh, which our users needs. Looking at heterogeneity enablement in terms of having a multi-cloud uh, support, uh, we today based out on Azure, Microsoft Azure, but looking at other uh, cloud providers and seeing that how we can be completely cloud agnostic. So heterogeneity enablement is a key aspect of our modernized data platform stack. 
and the key part which is more important for the bank and which is the final step probably in this journey is the analytics at scale uh, so deriving more value from the data so enterprise analytics adoption so not just limited to one or two business users but expanding it across the bank uh, so that this platform could be utilized at its full value and it can also serve the different business in terms of their insights in terms of the value realization in terms of what they want to achieve and the key aspect other than that is also to support on the federated capabilities development this is absolutely important for any organization to scale analytics it's not possible to have a limited uh, team or limited resources working on this but to have or and build a platform build the capabilities with the ease of use with in terms of what it provides so and also in terms of the trainings and the other uh, knowledge uh, capabilities that others require in terms to actually really scale the analytics so that's our vision that's our journey uh i hope it was a useful presentation in terms of giving you an overview of what sweat bank is how we traverse through our analytics journey how we've done our migration towards cloud and also what's next so thank you all for today and please reach out in case of any questions uh, you can hit me up on linkedin uh, i'm Vinit Menon, head of data lake engineering from sweat bank thanks Vinit, for your collaboration and thanks databricks for the partnership and this opportunity cheers